Howdy. Welcome to the Hot Rod Bible Study. Tonight we are continuing our study in the book of Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew 22. We got fairly far in Matthew 22 last week. Uh, this week we're starting at the 33rd verse. Um, it, Jesus is still dealing with the religious leaders uh, that really, well, we'll find out. They're, they're out to get him. Uh, they are uh, concerned for their position. They're more concerned for their position than the welfare of uh, the people. It, it's the deal where uh, instead of praying for the people, they pray P-R-E-Y on the people. And this is something that, this is a great study for us because it's something that we need to be aware of also. There are a lot of people out there uh, who purport to be on, you know, pastors, teachers, whatever, that aren't in for the money, not in it for uh, the service to God. So in that case, why don't we uh, stop right here and pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, we need you, and we desire to be closer to you in everything that we do, especially being in this study. Lord, open our hearts and minds to your study, and uh, as always, Lord, keep me uh, ever mindful of uh, the importance of this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Again, we're starting at the 34th verse, where it says... But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. And he said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord? saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. Continuing on chapter 23, it says, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say, and they do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at the feasts and the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is absolutely wonderful. Uh, Jesus really... These guys are really trying to throw one over on Jesus. And that 
That's awfully hard. It's kind of like us. Oh, uh, if we, you know, but nobody's looking to see what we're doing. Well, he's there. He sees what's going on. So trying to pull the wool over his eyes is futile at best. So now, beginning at the 31st verse, we say, it, well, it says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Remember, the Sadducees were the theological rivals of the Pharisees. Again, they were in the ruling uh, Oh, unit, that's not the word I'm looking for. But anyway, uh, the San, they were in the Sanhedrin, uh, and it's, pardon me, the ruling tribunal that, uh, that the two major parties, again, the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, when they heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, otherwise known as a scribe, someone who is uh, well-read and well-versed in the law, of Moses, also well studied in the law of Moses. And this lawyer asked him, Jesus, a question, testing him, once again trying to trip Jesus up. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, here's a note from John Trapp. It says, the rabbis reckoned up to 613 commandments of the law and distinguish them into greater and the lesser. The lesser, they thought, might be neglected or violated with little or no guilt. Isn't that interesting? But remember, sin is sin. It is all an affront to God. But these guys are trying to put them at a certain level and all this kind of stuff. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So what does Jesus do? He said to them, you, shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, there we go. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. And these words, with all, pardon me, with all your soul and with all your strength. That's where we're going to stop right there. Later on, we'll hit further. Okay, so this is exactly what Jesus is telling them. That is the greatest commandment. Now he goes on to say, this is the first and the great commandment. Okay, we've heard of the Ten Commandments. So why don't we look in Exodus chapter 20, which is where, by the way, you can find the Ten Commandments. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 3, where it says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Again, the first commandment. All right. And he goes on to say, we're talking about the greatest and the commandments. Remember, these guys had 613 commandments, and they were rating them all. Okay, and he said the second one is, is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, again, the reason I keep going back uh, into the Old Testament is because this is what Jesus is telling these guys. They should know these things. They should know the scriptures. So remember, we got the we have the, um, the scribes, the lawyer that we just talked about, who was well-versed in the law of Moses. And so they should know all of these things. Okay, so now we're looking at Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where it says, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but, here it is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Okay. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's awfully hard. Uh, a little bit of it is, too, you have to love yourself. If you're not very happy with yourself, you're not going to be very happy with others either. Now, I can go down that road. I, go, I am uh, one, I can be very judgmental of my own actions. Uh, and so it makes it a little tough. Um, God says don't do that. I'm working on it. Okay, verse 40. 
Jesus goes on to say, on these two commandments hang the law, all the law. Remember, all means all, that's all, all means. Hang all the law and the prophets. This applies to us today as well, okay? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That just pretty much covers, you know, it's, it just covers law and, and prophets all in one. Verse 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them. Now, he's turning the tables on them. He's saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David, which is a, a Jewish term for the Messiah. So this would be something um, that is, you know, just by rote. This would be their answer. Anybody would ask, this is the deal, the son of David. Okay. Now, thinking about this, they are thinking only in relation to um, uh, the, the, the bloodline. Okay, of Jesus. Okay, starting off with David and going through that. And as a matter of fact, we started off this study in Matthew 1 with all the begots. I know, it can get a little bit, a little bit tough, but when you see the lineage of Jesus goes through that way, that's, that's, that is the bloodline. And this was answered already. Okay, now he said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? Okay, we start off with the son of David is referring to Jesus' humanity. And calling him Lord is referring to his deity. Remember, Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. And so this is something that's kind of hard for our pea brains to understand, but that's what he is. He is God incarnate. You know, in the flesh, carne, like carne asada. That's where this word comes from, incarnate, in the flesh. Okay, now, how does David go, in, how does David in the spirit call the Lord sing? And here Jesus is quoting from Psalm 110, verse one. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. Again, Jesus, Jesus does this really well, and it's something that we need to think about. Uh, when Jesus was tempted, what did Satan keep doing? He kept throwing scripture at him. But like most people do, he kept quoted it out of context and for his own benefit. What did Jesus do? Responded to him with scripture. This is what Jesus is doing here to these Pharisees. He's responding to them with scripture, things they should know. And also when you respond with scripture, um, People can't argue with it. Well, they can, but they have no foundation, no basis. Okay, verse 45 says, If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Hmm. And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare question him anymore. He pretty much put an end to all that. Uh, they tried and they failed at embarrassing Jesus with these questions. As a matter of fact, they only embarrassed themselves. So what did they end up doing? Well, they ended up proceed to plot against him in private to, to kill him that, that much. Okay, now we're going on to chapter 23, where verse one says, then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and his disciples, who were all there, right, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Okay, now here's something interesting. According to William Barclay, the Talmud uh, describes seven, seven, pardon me, seven types of Pharisees. And here we go. The shoulder Pharisee, who wore all his good deeds and righteousness on his shoulder for everyone to see. The wait a little Pharisee, who always intended to do good deeds, but could always find a reason for doing them later, not now. The bruised and bleeding Pharisee, who was so holy that he would turn his head away from any woman in public, and was therefore constantly bumping into things and tripping and injuring himself. The humpback Pharisee, who was so humble that he walked bent over and barely lifting his feet, so everyone could see just how humble he was. You can get, this is a pretty good um, word picture, isn't it? The always counting Pharisee, 
who was always counting up his good deeds and believed that if he put God in debt to him for all the good deeds that he had done. The fearful Pharisee, who did good because he was terrified that God would strike him with judgment if he did not. And here we have the one and only good one, the God-fearing Pharisee, who really loved God and did good deeds to please the God he loved. Remember, uh, we had Nicodemus was a Pharisee, uh, the Apostle Paul, of course, when he was Saul being a Pharisee, he was persecuting the church, but these guys were also well-educated. All right, now, sitting in Moses' seat, well, which was a, a stone seat in the front of the synagogue, which is a place of authority. Uh, you may have seen such things where in front of a church where they have some sort of a large seat for somebody to sit down and preach or teach or whatever, kind of follow along the lines with the way it was in the synagogue back in ancient, in ancient uh, Jerusalem. Okay, verse 3 goes on to say, Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that, that observe and do. Isn't that interesting? If they tell you to observe something like that, you should do it. Why? Because it's pleasing to God. Uh, again, these are 613 different commandments that were supposed to keep you in good standing with God. But this is what's really great. It goes on to say, but do not do according to their works for what they say they do not do. Let me read that again. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, observe that observe and do, but do not do according to their works for they say and they do not do. We've all seen this. It's the old do as I say, not as I do stuff. Also, actions speaking louder than words, these different cliches for this. And this is really it. Verse 4, Jesus goes on to say, For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, so that but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Heavy burdens. What does Jesus have to say about that? Well, just happens to be in the book of Matthew as well. We're going to look at Matthew 11, 28 to 30. And this is Jesus speaking, saying, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Quite the opposite of the heavy burdens that the Pharisees were laying on these people. Now, it goes on to say, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. Phylactery. Well, that is a little leather box where they put uh, scripture inside that and they would tie them on their foreheads or around their forearms. Why would they do such a thing? Well, let's go back to Deuteronomy again. Okay. And we're staying in the sixth chapter, but we're going verses six or nine. It says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, which is true. Shall talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. This is all good. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. That's where they decided to do these phylacteries. Again, these leather boxes with scripture in them. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. Okay, so they have turned this into being something that shows off how groovy they are. You know, to be seen by men. And they and enlarging their, their garments. They'd have tassels to the bottom. Uh, the thought behind that was how many tassels, how many different commandments type of thing. And they're, they're enlarging their garments by hanging these tassels on them. And you've seen them on different uh, robes and such. Now, verse 6. They love the best places at feasts 
and the best seats in the synagogue. Yeah, give them the best, best seat in the house, man. Greetings in the marketplace and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. You know, that, oh, there goes, there goes Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Okay, this refers to the priesthood of all believers. You may have heard me speak about this before, but it means that if you are a believer, you do not need to go through a priest to get your sins forgiven, okay? You don't have to go to church to have your sins forgiven. Don't get me wrong. Going to church is a wonderful thing because you are in fellowship with others. And, and when you're praising with a whole mess of people, wow, it's just absolutely great. But here they are. The, it's really the priesthood of all believers. We don't have to go to a priest to get our sins forgiven or hope or anything like that. Um, Spurgeon puts it this way. I really like this. As I do a lot of his quotes. In the church of Christ, all titles and honors which exalt men and give occasion, for here it is, here's the word, pride, are hereby forbidden. Okay, here's the deal. When they get honors and titles which exalt men, if you want to upset my friend Ed Ray, call him Reverend. <laughs> It'll wind him up because he is not going to go down that road. Okay. It, it is, it's, it's really kind of a hoot because I will do that just to give him a hard time. But that's it because he really is on this that, you know what, uh, anything that gives occasion for pride must be forbidden. Now, here we go. Do not call anyone on your earth father. Okay, boy, you probably might be thinking about this. Um, if you're raised Roman Catholic, uh, I have a guy that you've heard me speak of before who became a, a Roman Catholic priest who ended up being a, um, oh, a chaplain in the Air Force. And I knew him as Francis when he was in high school. And, and when I got talked to him later, I call him Francis. People call him Frank. Okay, you know, I'll do that too. But there were people that I know that the class reunion that all of a sudden now he's not Francis, he's father. Ah, yikes. You know, it's going back to having those titles and honors which exalt men. And, and I'm not saying that everyone who is called father, Catholic priest or anything like that is, is, is bad. But I do want to say that doing this, uh, it, it goes towards pride. Okay, now, says. Don't call anyone on earth your father, for what is your father? He who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. All right, David Guzik puts it this way. Nevertheless, this command is often ignored and violated in the way people give and receive titles, such as prophet, apostle, most reverend, and all so on. It is also seen in the expected etiquette for closing a letter to the Pope. Get this, this is something that's new to me. If you finish up your letter to the Pope by saying, prostate at the feet of your holiness and imploring the favor of its apostolic benediction, I have the honor to be very holy father with the deepest veneration of your holiness, the most humble and obedient servant and son or daughter. Wow. Talk about, talk about puffing somebody up. Uh, we are sons and daughters of God, the Father himself. Not of the Pope, nobody else. Sons and daughters of God the Father. Which makes us brothers and sisters of Christ. Isn't that something? Because we are adopted into that family. Verse 12. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Now, who happens to be the greatest example of this, of humbling himself to be exalted? Well, of course, Jesus himself. Uh, here he is, again, came to earth, 
God incarnate uh, of lowly birth in a, in a feeding stall uh, and led a humble lifestyle and yet being the king of, above all kings and the creator of the universe. So there it is, once again, and he who, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, questions, comments, or smart aleck remarks? I'm waiting for my friend Doug Thompson to send something, uh, but he did send something uh, and he's right. Uh, he sent in a prayer request and we're going to do that right now. He's request a prayer for our country, for all the shenanigans that are going on, that we would, uh, that God would place it on the hearts of those with those shenanigans to turn their faces towards God. And also for those uh, in Hawaii and Lahaina specifically that, uh, with that devastating fire. So please join me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, again, we humbly come before you uh, seeking your blessing upon our country. Lord, we don't deserve it. We have turned our backs on you. We have, we have done which, what that which is not pleasing in your sight, uh, which if we go looking through the Old, Old Testament kings about they did what was evil in God's sight, and yep, that's what we're doing here in the United States. Forgive us, Lord. Place it upon those hearts who are doing evil in your sight to repent and turn back toward you, Lord. Help us all to be strong in our resolve to follow you. And Lord, again, we, we lift up those uh, who have lost people in the, in the devastating fires in Hawaii. And also we pray for protection on those who are left behind. Uh, be with them, Lord. Uh, you're, you're in charge, Lord. Thank you for those who are going over there uh, to help out. Uh, bless them, Lord. Bless each and every one of them. And Lord, I just pray these things in your Son's most holy name. And I'd like to say, Lord, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious upon you, gracious toward you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.